Well, good morning. My name is Jeremy, and I get the privilege of welcoming you today. If you're visiting with us, uh, we just want to say thank you. And we want to let you know about what's going on in the life of the church. So um, pastors Jim and Dory are on sabbatical for the next uh, 11 weeks. And so we as a church have uh, decided to enter into that sabbatical season with them. So uh, during this, this time, these next few weeks, we're calling our sabbatical time winter, which is a time of reflection and rest. And so uh, we uh, each, if you look through the sabbatical kind of calendar that we have out in the foyer, you can grab one. It will tell you that uh, every month we also have some kind of special events. And so this last weekend, yesterday and Friday, we had Mylon and Kay here sharing um, uh, at the How We Love conference. And uh, here's the beautiful thing. So we had... Uh, about 250 people sign up online, and we were we were ready for that, and we had almost another 100 plus show up at the door. So we had about 400 people here this weekend to hear and just receive and to work on their marriage, and uh, so it was uh, it was pretty awesome, and we had a great time. And I'm very thankful, just on a personal level, uh, for Mylon, Mylon and Kay. I uh, I actually discovered their book, the short story, because I want to give Mylon as much time as possible. But I discovered their book when I was in counseling. Um, I kind of hit a wall and I ended up in a counselor's office and spent 30 days actually in an inpatient counseling trying to figure out what was going on with me. I got their book about that time and started to realize that what I was reading in the pages of this book was exactly what was happening in the counselor's office with me. And I started to recognize that I had a lot of pain and a lot of brokenness that I was seeing the world through. And so I, I appreciate on a personal level just how much the book has impacted me, how much has impacted my relationship with my wife, how we now practice some of the principles that we learned in that book. And so, um, Mylon, would you come and share with us? If you don't know Mylon, he, him and his wife Kay wrote the book, How We Love, but he also uh, is involved with New Life Radio. So if you hadn't had, haven't had a chance to hear him there, he's, uh, he's on there periodically. But Mylon, we're thankful to have you with us, so come and share with us today. Well, thank you. Hello, everyone. It's great to be with you. I am from California. Please don't hold that against me. It's called the left coast of our United States. And um, we're just I'm delighted to be with you. I have family, actually. I'm hoping that will be a little grace to help get me into your graces. They live here in Idaho. And uh, my wife's sister and brother-in-law live in Haley, and um, so I love to come here and, and fly fish. I, there's no fly fishing in Southern California by Disneyland. It, there just isn't any. You know, I, I could practice in my backyard, but there's just nothing there, so I have to come here. And I'm delighted to be here. We have a lot of friends in the uh, Boise area, and um, love Idaho. It's a great place. And... Uh, we were very pleased to be invited to come to the workshop this weekend, and uh, it was a privilege to be here. And then I know I've had some of you come up and greet me uh, as being listeners at New Life, and it is wonderful to meet many of you personally. Uh, I want you to think about a time that you were stressed recently. Now, for many of you, that would be on your way to church today. Uh, because I don't know what it is about church, but we get super stressed on our way to this holy place, uh, and we don't act holy on the way here sometimes. Uh, and I know that, having personal experience with that. But I want you to think, what stressed you recently? What stressed you? Maybe today, maybe this week, something stressed you. And I want you to just stop and think about that for a split second. And then I want you, please, to um, ask yourself, well, what did you do with that? What'd you do? What'd you do when you were stressed? Some of us ramp up into uh, a place where we sort of explode uh, all over the environment around us. And sometimes there's people in that environment, and we just, when we're stressed, we, we explode. Some of us internalize and we put the lid on and we, we just shut it all down inside and we hold it in. And neither one of these are constructive for a relationship. Uh, but stop and ask yourself now, what did my parents do? What did they model to me when they were stressed when I was growing up? And if they're here in the room with you, don't say anything out loud. Just, just, just saying. And what do you do? 
What did they do? What do you see modeled to you? Because you see, we typically do what we were trained to do. We typically do how we were modeled. And then our natural propensities in nature are to do what our, uh, our Adam and Eve did, which is to be fearful and hide and cover ourselves and then blame other people. And that's typically what we do. We isolate and we hide and we cover and we don't tell people the truth. But I really want to stop and ask ourselves the question, when, what did Jesus do the day he was perhaps the most stressed he was ever going to be, the night before he died? And he knew he was going to die, and what did he do when he was stressed? Because what he did is he modeled emotional and relational intelligence amidst the stress. You know, it's easy to be a nice guy or a nice gal when you're not stressed, we're all pretty, we're all a lot nicer. Especially, I'm really a cool dude when I'm alone. Uh, and I, I don't bug myself very much. I crack myself up all the time. And, and I don't get too stressed when I'm by myself. But, but put me with people and that, you know, I start to be more stressed because it's an interesting thing that happens. But what do we do with this thing called stress, and how do we bring it into a place where we can be more emotionally intelligent with that stress and more relationally intelligent? Let's take a lesson from Christ. I keep dropping this thing. I don't know. I'll, I'll come back to this in a second. So let's look at what Jesus did the night before he was stressed. And in Matthew, the night before he died, where he was entirely stressed, Matthew 26, verse 36. The Garden of Gethsemane. Then Jesus came with them to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to his disciples, sit here while I go over there and pray. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, which are James and John. And he began to be grieved and distressed. And he said to them, my soul is deeply grieved to the point of death. Remain here and keep watch with me. And he went a little beyond them. He fell on his face. And he prayed, saying, Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me, yet not as I will, but as thou wilt. And he came to the disciples, and he found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, So you men could not keep watch with me for one hour? Keep watching and praying that you may not enter into temptation, because the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. And he went away again a second time and prayed, saying, Father, if this cannot pass away unless I drink it, then thy will be done. And he came back, and he found them sleeping, for their eyes were heavy. And he left them again, and he went away and prayed the third time, saying the same thing once more. And then he came to his disciples and said to them, Are you still sleeping and taking your rest? Behold, the hour is at hand. The Son of Man is being betrayed into the hands of sinners. Arise, let us be going. Behold... The one who betrays me is at hand. So what do I learn about Jesus at his most stressful moment? What did he model for us at this critical time in his life? Number one, Jesus faced his pain uh, instead of avoiding it or distracting himself. Everybody in this room feels pain on the inside. You feel distress. Everybody feels at some level agitated, unhappy, depressed, anxious, fearful. Because life is hard. Life is challenging. And he faced his pain. He didn't avoid it. A lot of us avoid pain. A lot of us distract ourselves. A lot of us turn on music and noise and TV. And, and we'll, we'll, we'll make noise. Uh, We'll go do stuff. We'll stay very busy. Busyness is a distraction, is it not? It keeps us from feeling things. But inside, everybody in this room, everybody, without exception, feels angst inside, distress, as well as joys and happiness. But we feel these things on the inside. He faced it. I I used to avoid and distract myself from internal pain. If I ever felt anxious or fearful, I would just go run. Now, skinnier then, um, and and one of the advantages of being anxious and 
and or frightened is I exercised a lot. Best shape of my life. I'm heavier now that I'm less anxious. Uh, and, and, but I would avoid it and distract myself through exercise. Or I'd distract myself through music or staying busy. What do you do? How do you, how do you avoid your pain instead of facing it? See, he went to this private garden with his disciples on purpose. It was to deal and wrestle with this stuff. It was a direct response to face his pain. Number two, Jesus felt his pain. He did not hide his emotions. He felt them. It says he began to be grieved and distressed. Now, he hadn't spoken a word yet, hadn't said one word. But he began to be grieved and distressed. Now, I want you to picture in your head what a person would look like who is grieved and distressed. They're probably starting to cry. They're probably starting to feel their face is probably starting to contort at some level. Uh, They're probably pacing or they're frozen. They might be kicking the dust. They might be pacing back and forth. They might be just looking up. They might be just breathing in a way differently. But he felt his pain. He didn't try to avoid it or distract himself, he had a stress response. It was visible. You could see that he was uncomfortable. He knew what was coming. You have a stress response. And as I said before, each one of us has something you probably do a lot. Whenever you're stressed, you typically probably do the same thing. I remember our, we have four kids that are now grown and have their kids which makes me a grandparent, and um, they each had something different that they did. My oldest son would just absolutely take his angst and irritation and irritability, and the whole house could feel all of that. Everybody in the house could feel when he was, because he'd let it out. And, And we all were therefore subject to whatever he was feeling. My other son would go to his room, close the door, and isolate, and that's what he did. But Jesus was openly distressed. He didn't hide what was going on inside. Number three, Jesus was self-aware, and his self-awareness gave him the ability to describe his emotions. Because he was self-aware, he could reach down into his soul and retrieve words and vocabulary to bring to the outside. Because guess what? I can't read your mind, and you can't read mine. Here's an interesting brain teaser for you. God, who can read our minds, still asks us to ask him for things in this thing called prayer. Isn't that weird? He knows what I need. Why would he ask me to ask? Because he can read my mind. He knows what I want. Anyhow. But he still asked me to ask. But we can't read. That was for free. That was extra. I just threw that in. <laughs> but we can't read each other's minds. And But what he said was, he opened his mouth, and after this stress response, he opened his mouth and proactively said to Peter, James, and John, he said, my soul is distressed to the point of death. Come watch and pray with me. The word soul is a Greek word, suke, P-S-U-C-H-E, from which we get the word psychology, which is the study of the inner man. He said, the inner man, the part deep down inside of me, is distressed to the point of death. Come watch and pray with me. He had emotional intelligence. See, our God is emotionally intelligent God, and we're made in his image and likeness, yet, as C.S. Lewis said, the image is bent or it's marred, it's broken. We don't quite represent him. We're close, but not, there's a distortion to it, a brokenness. And one of those brokennesses is, is that we come to Christ, but when we come to Christ, we're just a baby. And as a baby, we don't necessarily know what to do as a baby. And then the Bible calls us, if we grow, we're more of a child that's tossed here and there by every wind of doctrine and craftiness and deceitful scheming. And then, and then if we keep growing, we're called a young man in the faith. 
where we're strong and the Word of God abides in us and we've overcome the evil one. And then if we keep growing, we become someone like a father who knows him who is from the beginning. So there's a maturity process that God calls us to walk through as Christians. And to ask ourselves, where are we? And are we progressing in this sense of maturity? So that I take the flesh and I mature it into something that resembles Christ. And if I want to grow and resemble Christ more fully, then I need to develop emotional intelligence because our God is an emotionally intelligent God. And from Genesis to Revelation, he shows every emotion in the book. Does he not? Okay, when I shake my head up and down, that means to say yes. So I'm going to do it again. From Genesis to Revelation... He shows every emotion in the book, right? Yes. yes, he does. And he tells us why he feels it and what he's going to do about it or where it came from, its origins and or the reactions that were going to happen as a result of that or the consequences or the blessings. He clues us in. He tells us what's happening. Number three, or excuse me, number four, what did Jesus do? He asked for help from safe people. He asked for help from safe people. You see, he had what is what I call horizontal support. A lot of us think all I need is vertical, vertical support. The word of God and prayer and God, and that's all I need. And the Bible doesn't say that. God says, absolutely, you need me. You need the word of God. But I also want you to have horizontal support in your network to undergird you as a human being. You need community. As a matter of fact, God has never not existed in community. I know I used a double negative there. He has never not existed in community. The Trinity, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the Trinitarian God that we believe in. God has never been alone. He has always existed in this thing called community. And he wants us to have safe people. Peter, James, and John were his closest disciples. And he says, be with me and keep watch with me. See, the this bulk of disciples were over here. Judas was gone betraying him and coming back. He had the bulk of disciples over here. And then he had Peter, James, and John here. And then he was here. And he asked these people to be in fellowship with him while he was suffering and in this stressful state. And he asked for help from saved people. Now, these were his closest friends. Now, how were they close? He took these three disciples and did special things with them. He took them on special little field trips that he didn't take the other apostles on and disciples. He, helped, he took them to a place where they raised a little girl from the dead. He did various and other things with them. He explained parables to them that he didn't explain to others. And he also took them to the Mount of Transfiguration where he said, I'm going to show you the most intimate view of me possible. I'm going to show you what I look like in heaven. And I'm going to show you what I look like in all my glory. And oh, by the way, there's Moses walking over there. And oh, that's Elijah. Remember Elijah? He's walking right there. And then they got to hear the Heavenly Father's voice. This is my beloved son. Listen to him. And then all of a sudden, it all went away, and they walked down the hill with the other disciples. But Peter, James, and John were special. They were his safe people. Who are your safe people? Who are they? Who are the people that you have cultivated in community friendships with that you can share your honest and real self with. But Jesus asked for help from safe people. And then he wanted to have him by his side while he was suffering. He didn't want to be physically alone. And then number five, Jesus asked for help from the Heavenly Father. Vertical support. So Jesus had self-awareness, horizontal support, and vertical support all at the same time. This is how he dealt with his stress. Three times he asked, for God, he asked God for divine assistance, divine deliverance. Three times. Are you sure we can't renegotiate? Is there another way to do this thing? Now, he had known about this for a long time, okay, because he's eternally existent. Part of the Trinity has never not existed. I don't understand that, but it, it's true. The Bible says that. And the Bible says that Jesus is described in the book of Revelation as the lamb that was slain before the foundation of the world. So before the foundation of the world, he knew all about this slaying of the lamb. He was the lamb that was going to die on that cross right there for your sins and mine. 
And even though he knew this, it was he knew the next day it was coming. And it stressed him out. And three times he asked God for divine deliverance. So he had horizontal support, self-awareness, and vertical support with safe people. And then number six, we learned that Jesus' prayer was filled with emotion. He was deeply emotional before his God. Many of us, including myself, tend to be very stoic in front of God, especially when I'm praying or talking to the Lord and even worshiping, I'm very stoic. We all can be. But he was filled with emotion. As a matter of fact, in the book of Hebrews, it says he was filled with great loud crying and tears in Hebrews. He was wailing, Hebrews says, very loud crying and tears. This was not a pleasant experience for him to go through. He was super stressed, stressed to the max. And he was so stressed in the book of Luke, it says there was blood mixed with his sweat. So he had red driplets coming off of his body, and he was wet with sweat and blood. He was an emotional mess, but he didn't do it alone. He had self-awareness. He could describe his soul. He had horizontal support. He had vertical support. He was in agony. And Jesus' faith was then displayed, number seven, his faith, his faith was displayed when he placed the final outcomes into the hands of the Heavenly Father. He says, now, this is totally up to you, Lord. Your will, not mine, be done. And as a result of that, this is a process. Do you see this is a process? He planned it. He walked through it. He had the elements and the segments and the emotionality and the cognition all wrapped together. He had it all. And number eight, as we observe and model Christ, Evidently, this gave him strength because he exhibited strength from this point on. He was able to walk into stand up after all this emotional display. He had some resolution that took place. He had an internal resolve. He had a cognitive resolve. He had an emotional resolve. He could rise up and say, the deliverers are coming, or the ones that are going to deliver me into the hands of, of the people that will kill me, they've come. So rise up, everybody. Here we go. He had a strength, having gone through this. He had strength and resolve to face the betrayal of Judas with a kiss. The arrest with clubs and swords. Like, and Jesus says, like, you need clubs and swords. I've been in the temple the whole time. You need to arrest me like a robber? The beatings, the crucifixion, he had the resolve to do it. Because he went through this process of bringing his stress, not exploding all over people because he was upset because he was going to die the next day, or stuffing it all, which destroys our internal self, literally. Stress internalized absolutely sabotages our immune system. Absolutely sabotages our gut, our heart, our mind, our neck, our body, our physiology. Internalized and unprocessed stress is a destructive, destructive force. Somehow Jesus did it in a different way. And I think that we need to observe how he did it, how he went about managing stress. And let's make some applications for ourselves. Ready? Here's some applications for you and me to take home with us here. Number one. We have to acknowledge that pain is a part of the human reality. A lot of us don't want to acknowledge that. We don't want to acknowledge that there is pain every day. Somehow it can feel uh, unreligious. Somehow it can feel like you don't have enough faith to acknowledge pain. Now, everybody's memorized Romans 8.28. Not everybody, but a lot of people have because it's a, one of those cool positive verses and we love positivity, don't we? It says, yes, thank you for saying yes. Yeah, and I hadn't even really shook my head yet, but yes, we do, we love positivity. And it says, God causes all things to work together for good to them who love the Lord and who are called according to his purpose. Yay, Christians. <laughs> but the verses right before that say, and the ones we don't memorize, is that God caused the creation to be subjected to futility. He subjected the creation to futility. A state of futility, not ideal, not optimal, but futility. And all creation groans 
longing to be redeemed and lifted out of this place of groaning. Thus we wait for our final redemption. And that is one of the hopes of the Christian is to be freed from what it feels like to live here. We don't know what freedom feels like until we enter into glory and we're freed from this thing called the flesh. Amazing to think about. And yet, have you ever been in a church where we sing songs and, and then we're told to stand up, shake the hands of five people and ask them where they're groaning today? Tell me, come on, share groaning with me, share a little pain with me, come on, I know it's in there, what you feeling? Because everybody in this room has felt that. They feel that pain, they feel that stress, and God calls us to this place of community where we're supposed to support each other in this. But what the interesting thing about all of this is that in that state of groaning and in the place of pain being a part of the human reality, guess what exposes my pain the most? Relationships. And you work with people at church, you go to work, you, you get married, you parent, you, you have friends, and they show the real us. Friendships and relationships expose the real me. I'm a really nice guy all by myself. I'm funny, too. I crack myself up driving down the freeway. I don't bug myself very much. But put me together with people, and I bug people, and they bug me. And, and, and relationship exposes irritability, it exposes anger and rage, it exposes reactivity, it exposes those of us that overtrust, it exposes those of us that undertrust, it exposes avoidance, uh, perhaps or exposes the, that I'm a controller, it exposes whether I'll tell the truth or not. It exposes whether I'll allow others to control me. It'll expose whether or not I have an excessive need for approval and harmony. It'll expose whether I idealize and devalue. It will expose whether I choose to fight, flight, or freeze. Relationships do that. We have brokenness from our parents, Adam and Eve. We are sons of, and daughters of Adam and Eve. And as a result, we have this thing about us that needs to be sanctified over the course of time on this planet. And the movement from birth to more Christ-like is a thing called sanctification, and God calls us to do that. And emotional intelligence is one of those components we are told to bring in to that sanctification journey. Application number two, each of us has a familiar stress response. Go back to that thing I asked you at the very beginning. What'd you do? What did you do? And, and I'm going to ask you this. Did you take that stress into relationship? And did, did that stress take you to a place where you walked into relationship with someone, a Peter, James, and John, and you found somehow, as Jesus did, relief in a thing called relationship? Or did you take that stress into a non-relational place of relief, non-relational. Now, what's over here in the non-relational place of relief? What do we do to get rid of these unpleasant feelings on the inside in our brains that are spinning on a spin cycle with thoughts that repeat over and over and over and over again? We turn to often non-relational ways to find relief. If I ask you to just tell us what some of those are, you guys would come up with a list of dozens of things. From addictions, to obsessing, to worry, despair, anxiety, and just such negative spin cycles we put ourselves into because we choose to do it alone instead of in this thing called community that God calls us to. And behind closed doors, really, who are we? You know, a church today or in the if you're out in public, you, you'll hold, you can hold up, I can hold up a facade of competency. I can show you, hold up a facade that says, here's, here's what I want you to see. A polished, put together me. And so many times, I want to believe that facade myself. I want to believe it. I want to talk myself into the fact that that's the real me. I know it is. And I live near Disneyland, and Disneyland has this thing called Main Street, 
And it is so cool to walk down Main Street. It has so much ambiance. And it is so, it, it, it just, it's just this warmth, it's just an experience of warmth and fun. And, and, and it just is cool. And I knew this lady that worked there and she said, I love walking down Main Street when the park is empty and it's closing time and I, I get to walk out. It's just magical. And I popped her bubble and I said, well, you know, they're only facades of those, those walls and those, those storefronts. They're only facades. That behind that facade are, are, are utility carts and trash cans and Mickey Mouse has his head off. And Mickey Mouse isn't so cute with the head off. And Donald Duck, and they're all sitting around, you know, doing whatever they do behind closed doors. You see, there's an, un, an un, unpleasant other side. There's another side that is an unattractive side. And do we know how to take that unattractive part of myself and show it to somebody? Jesus did. He was a mess, and he showed it to people. Can we show each other our messes? And then we learn, as Christians, the value of self-awareness. Now, you have a little bookmark that you got when you came in, a little bookmark. And on the orange side, the other side was supposed to be blue, but I, I made a mistake. It was supposed to be blue and orange, okay? It's green and orange. So just look at the, just look at the orange side. You're familiar with that color. And <clears throat> what do I feel today? Do I feel uh, confident, positive, secure, or do I feel overwhelmed, a little burdened, distressed, panicky, weighted down? You see, Jesus was able to reach down inside. Our emotionally intelligent God is able to reach down inside and pull out a vocabulary and then share it with other people. I had to learn to do this. I started learning how to, to put words to what my soul was feeling about 30 years ago. And I've been working on it for the last 30 years. My wife and I and family, friends, close people, and in our counseling offices that we have, um, we teach people how to begin to access their internal self, and to put words to who and what they are on the inside. And so if that's, with that self-awareness, we're able then to first admit it to me. It was scary to admit things to myself, who I was, what I was, what was the unpleasant side on the other side of Main Street, on the other side of the facades. I always ask a question in my house, and what happens behind closed doors? I wonder what that person is like behind closed doors. I wonder what their marriage is like behind closed doors. I wonder what kind of parent they are behind closed doors. I wonder what kind of a friend they are behind closed doors. I wonder what they do with their stress behind closed doors. And congruency and integrity demand and require of us that we are through and through the same, that what is true behind closed doors is true out in Main Street, Disneyland, and what's true in Main Street, Disneyland is also true behind closed doors. And then I learned the, the importance of, and we're going to come back to this in a second, but, but this is something you can keep with you to actually access, and I started to say, it was not easy even to tell myself. The number two, it wasn't easy to tell my wife what was going on inside me. But we found as we did, we began to feel closer and closer and closer. It was scary at first, really scary to share the real me to Kay. My wife's name is Kay. And it was, it was really hard for me to do. It was frightening. But the more we did it, the braver we got, and the more of these words we would share. And so today, this week, at least twice a day, we will know what's going on inside ourselves and inside each other. Because we will, we've developed this vocabulary and we have the ability to tell one another. And then guess what? This is really cool. This changed my prayer life. Because I could bring the real me, all of me, to God and bring the real me into relationship with my Heavenly Father. Now, isn't that kind of what David did in the Psalms? Didn't he bring his emotions? To, did David bring his emotions to God? 
He brought all of himself. He brought his joy and elation and dancing before the Lord, and he brought his sorrow and his tears. And he says, you know, my bed is wet with tears. I've been crying all night. And it's right smack dab in the middle of the Bible for us to see. And he's, God says that David is a man after my own heart. And so the ability to then have words to give to myself, those around me, and to my Heavenly Father in this thing called prayer was very valuable because I could bring the real me into relationship. And I learned to do that the second half of my life, not the first half. Um, changed my life to be able to do that, to become more what God wanted me to be. And then I realized, number four, the importance of safe people. Um, we, have to, we move from the original origins that we come from our father and mother and father, Adam and Eve, and then our biological parents and the people who raised and reared us. And they, they did whatever they could do to, to get us along into life. And, and in many cases, they did the best they knew how to do. But ultimately, as adults, we have to decide, well, who am I and what do I want to retain that was imprinted into me? And what do I want to move on to more resemble Christ? And what do I want to do to grow and become more Christ-like? And the church is supposed to be a place of healing and repair from the world. Healing and repair. And the only way we can heal, heal and prepare is to put ourselves into a position where we find ourselves in community and we have safe people where we can be honest, vulnerable, and transparent. That's not what the world does, by the way. The world does not know how to do that, and the world doesn't do that. As a matter of fact, if you're emotionally honest, vulnerable, and transparent, you might get a knife in the back. Or you might be betrayed, or it might be used against you, or you might be manipulated, or you might be hurt. But the Bible says, no, we're supposed to bring ourselves into relationship here where there's a vulnerability and a trust that you'll take care of me and I'll take care of you. Who are your safe people? You must cultivate them. It's interesting, some of you were really um, harmed in relationship, perhaps in your families growing up, perhaps in other adult relationships, perhaps in work or church. You feel harmed in relationship. Here's the irony. We're healed in relationship. And if we're hurt in relationship, we think, well, I don't want to enter back into relationship. That was hurtful. But yet God calls us to this place called community where we can experience healing and change. But we have to learn to discern and find safe people. Not all people are safe. I have a, I, I designed this thing called a safety pyramid. And if you just think of a triangle or a pyramid and divide it into thirds, the bottom third is acquaintances, acquaintances. That's the base. That's the vast majority of people in my life. The middle third are friends. And the top small section are my safe people. And so here's a couple of rules of the pyramid. All people, all people, including family members who might not be safe at all, if they're here with you in this room, we won't say anything about that right now, but all people enter in at the bottom. As an adult, I choose who I'll let into my life. As a kid, I, I couldn't choose. I was subject to and had to do whatever my family said I had to do. But all people enter in here at the bottom of the safety pyramid, and they work their way up over time. And they work from point to point to point, from section to section, and they earn their way up. And they don't know they're being tested, but I might tell somebody just a little something and see if they ever remember that and ask me how that's doing. If I tell and ask somebody to pray for me about something or somebody asks me an honest, vulnerable question, I give them an honest and vulnerable answer. If they never bring it up again, then it, they might be my good friend, but they might not be a fully safe person. And over time, they work their way up to a safe person. They can be demoted if I, if I, if I found that they were too safe. I thought they were safe, but they ended up not being. And then they, um, it probably takes two years for a person to kind of work their way up to the top. 
of being a safe person in my world. And then these people are the people with whom I share the most of myself. And then down the progression of safe to friends to acquaintances, I, I share just a little less and a little less and a little less of myself. That God has called us this thing called community. And it's interesting that Jesus in his humanity had three humans that were his closest friends. And oh, by the way, he invested the most into them. And he shared the most intimate experiences. He shared what he looked like in heaven. And then he shared what he looked like in death with his most intimate friends. And then on hanging on the cross, that, that cross right there, hanging on that cross... He had developed such an intimate relationship with these three guys that he says to John, John, I want you to take care of my mom. Mom, I want this guy right here to be your son. Jesus had siblings. They weren't on board with him yet. And guess what? They weren't safe people yet. And then what did he do with Peter, James, and John? He started the whole church with them. You and I are here because Peter, James, and John, and the rest of the disciples, we don't hear much of them, and the apostles, we don't hear much about them. But Peter, James, and John were the heads and the leaders of the early church because he had invested the most into them. And then he had safe people. Let me quickly wrap up here. Number five, faith and emotional struggles. I learned this from Jesus. Faith and emotional struggles can coexist. A lot of us believe that if I show emotional struggle or, or I, my knees buckle before God that somehow I'm not exhibiting enough faith. Some people actually believe that any hesitation of faith means that God therefore won't answer my prayer and I have to sum up the greatest amount of faith, even denying reality, if you will, in order to get God to believe I really believe in him and then he'll answer my prayers. I hope I'm not stepping on any toes here uh, today, but as Christians, what am I supposed to do with negative emotions? We all feel them. We're either going to acknowledge them or we're going to ignore them and pretend they're not there. It's okay to be not okay. It's okay not to be okay. Um, faith does not equal lack of struggle. Faith was exhibited when Jesus said, whatever you decide, God, I'll rest in that. That's where faith was. The struggle, the emotional struggle, does not mean he didn't have faith. That little line, whatever thy will not might be done, it, that's the faith piece. And he had all this emotional struggle in the middle of it, but faith was exhibited when he turned the final outcomes over to the Heavenly Father. And then, number six, in order to successfully develop and grow as Christians, we need to do some commands and scriptures that often we're not used to doing because we don't develop this emotional intelligence piece, which are the one another's of scripture. If you just get out of concordance and you look up other and one and one and others, you'll find over two dozen of them, one and others. And they are commands for you and me to do with one another. And these commands are the horizontal thing that God says, I want to meet many of your needs horizontally here in the body of Christ. I want you to palpably feel me by a hug from you or an embrace from you, or tears from you, or that you'll answer my, you'll pray for me. I, he wants me to palpably feel his presence through other people in this thing called the body of Christ. As a matter of fact, if we're not emotionally intelligent, that is the ability to reach down in our souls and retrieve words to tell others, and then we'll come into community, guess what? We won't be able to do what God tells us. He tells us to love one another, serve one another. How can I love you if I don't know what's in your soul? He tells us to use our gifts and serve each other. How can I serve you if I don't know what your needs are? He tells me to encourage you and you me. How can we encourage each other if we don't know where we're discouraged? I have to be honest and admit that. He tells us to comfort one another. How can I comfort you if you don't tell me where you're uncomfortable? Or I tell you where I'm uncomfortable or where I'm in pain. He tells us to bear one of those burdens, but if you don't tell me where that burden is, I can't help you bear it. And he tells us to confess our sins and pray for one another. And so the green side, which today we're pretending is blue, um, 
is the, what we call the comfort circle, which is a little guide to help us enter into this thing called community. And you already know what seeking awareness is. We're reaching down and finding words to describe our soul. Number two, we're going to engage and tell one another. The comfort circle says we're going to tell one another. Ephesians says, speak the truth in love, each one of you with his neighbor. Then number three, we're supposed to listen to each other and ask each other questions. Be quick to hear. Quick to hear. Quick, quick, quick. Tell me more, tell me more, tell me more, tell me more. Instead, we're quick to speak and quick to anger, to shut people down. We don't want to hear because we don't have a lot of tolerance for hearing things we don't agree with or that we don't like or is disruptive or agitating to us. And then we're told to comfort one another or create some resolution. Listen, my life changed when I learned how to begin to do this comfort circle. This changed my life. I'm more bonded to my wife. I'm more bonded to my kids and grandkids. I have friends that I'm very close to because we do this thing every day. Just a little bit. We're not nauseatingly emotional. <laughs> and I love cognitive things and to use my head and think. But I also was made in the image and likeness of God, which is to have emotions. And I learned to access them instead of pretending they weren't there. I hope this will help you to begin to enter into a journey where you feel like I want to become more like God in that emotional intelligence and that it's a part of how God wants to equip me. It's part of my spiritual development to be also emotionally developed. And I hope that this has been a blessing to you. It's been a wonderful time to be with you this whole weekend for this whole conference. So, Jeff, Pastor Jeff, come on up. Marlon. Let's close with a word of prayer. Lord, we are thankful for the model that you show us in your word and through your son of what it means to be self-aware and emotionally intelligent and how we can relate not only to you as we see Jesus model that, but to one another as well. And my brother is correct, Lord. The church is called to be a place where we can be honest with one another, where we can be horizontally supportive of one another. And so I pray, Lord, for my brothers and sisters here this morning that you, Holy Spirit, will enable us to be the sort of folks who are safe, people of refuge, who allow honesty and transparency across the board in relationships where it's safe to do so, Lord. And Father, bring people in each of our lives who can become safe folks for us, where we can display a full range of emotions with one another in safety and security, and where we can comfort one another. So thanks, Lord, for this time. Thanks for the lessons we've learned. Thanks for Mylon and Kay and for their ministry. Pray blessing over them as they continue their travels and continue their ministry, Lord. Would you anoint them for the task ahead and bless them as they go, Lord, as you bless us as we go as well. It's in Christ's name we pray these things. Amen. Lord bless you. Have a great week.